Good morning. In Matthew chapter 5, we have the story of Jesus in Gethsemane. Twenty six, sorry. And uh, I want to go through this story here to begin with. Jesus came unto the place of Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here, and I'm going to pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy and said, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Stay here, tarry ye here, and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and praying, Oh, Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he comes back to his disciples and he finds them sleeping. And says to Peter, What? Couldn't you watch with me? Couldn't you stay awake with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went away the second time and prayed, O Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep. For their eyes were heavy. That's familiar. And he left them and went away again and prayed a third time, saying the same words. Then he comes back to his disciples and says, Sleep on now. Take your rest. The hour is here that the Son of Man is betrayed to the hands of sinners. Arise, let us be going. Behold, he that is at hand, he is at hand that does betray me. And then Judas comes, one of the twelve, kisses Jesus, the guards grab him, and the disciples run for their lives. All of them. Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Jesus wants his disciples to pray, to watch and pray. Why? He knew it was going to be too late once the temptation was actually there. We can't start getting ready when the enemy attacks. If we start getting our armor on, when the enemy's here, we've lost the battle. If we start getting ready once the enemy starts firing, we're too late. And do we know when the enemy's going to strike? Do we know when he's going to come? No. He doesn't warn. It's not his usual way of, hey, I'm coming. There's going to be a temptation tomorrow at 12.05. Make sure you got your armor on. It's not what happens. It's not what happens. And so we need to walk prepared. When we encounter trials, and let's say we do fail, we don't do a good job of walking through them, where do we go from there? Do we turn to who we should have gone to in the first place or to a counterfeit? That's what I want to talk about today. My message today is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. And, it, and I want to talk about us being ready. Us being on guard. Us being prepared to face whatever it is you're going to face. And you're going to face something. And I'm going to face something. And what does it mean? Hebrews 12 shows us how we can have grace, why we can have grace, why it's available to us, 
and in which circumstances we need that grace. So here we are. We're in our garden. And the question is, are we sleeping? Or are we awake and getting ready? Hebrews chapter 12. Let's go through this. It says, We're encompassed about by a great cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despised the shame, is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider Him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind, ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Okay, so one of the encouragements that Hebrews 12 gives us here for facing our trials and facing temptation, there's two things here. One of them is, you know, there's a lot of people who've lived and walked before me. And if they could be successful, if they could be victorious, if they could win, if they can overcome, isn't the same grace available to me? We have a cloud of witnesses. We have many people who have walked before us. We have their stories. We know their names. They knew the same God that you and I know. And the same grace that they had is available for us. We have a cloud of of witnesses. It's not just one or two. It's many who have walked before us. And uh, Hebrews chapter 11 talks about many of those. It gives us their names. It tells us their stories. And many have walked since then. We have a cloud of witnesses. We can run the race as they, as they did. Second, Jesus is our example. Consider Jesus. Why was Jesus in the garden, and he could go through what he could go through, and everyone else ran away. Hebrews 4. No, that's not Hebrews 4. Hebrews 3, verse 12. No, it's not that one either. Um... I'll just leave that one. No, it's 2 9. There we go. Hebrews 2 9 says, But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. The thing that took Jesus, that carried him, that brought him to the cross and made him able to go through what he went through, is available to us. All grace. By grace, he was able to taste death for every man. And so we have this cloud of witnesses. They, have, they had what we have. We have Jesus. We have available to us what he had. The same grace from the same God. And so here we are today, we have Jesus, we have the cloud of witnesses, our example, and now he says, okay, here's your life. Uh, he goes on and says, and talks about chastening. And says, in your life you're going to have chastening. It's going to, you're going to come across things that are going to hurt. You're going to have lessons that are going to hurt in your life. You're going to have to learn some things, and some of these things are going to be painful and it calls him ch chastening and um, why chastening why do we need this and what do we need to remember in the middle of our chastening can we have grace available for us even when we're being chastened uh, there's a few things to remember here in chastening number one in verse five it says it's coming from our Father. Coming from our Father. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you are rebuked of Him. For whom the Lord loves, 
he chastens, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he? What kind of son is this that the father doesn't correct him and say, hey, you made a mistake here. No, don't act like this. No, you shouldn't have had that attitude. I don't like the way you spoke over there. What son is there that loves his child that does not correct him? What love is that? Verse 8 says, we are illegitimate children if he does not chastise us. Verse 11, now no chastening for the present seems to be joyous. Oh, no trials today. It seems to be joyous, but grievous. Chastening is never nice. It's never enjoyable. It's never something that we're like, this feels good. There, there's no such thing. They're hard. But afterward, they yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness. And that's what we look forward to. It's one of the things that motivated Jesus when he went to the cross. He looked forward to the end result. He looked forward to what would happen as a result of him suffering. And so that's one way we can go through chastening. Because we know it's good for me. Yes, it hurts, but it's good. It's good for me. And we, we grow thereby. And we have fruits of righteousness that come out of our life from a father that corrects. And that chastens and says, no, don't walk this way. Don't do that. Go this way. This is the Father, our Father, who loves and cares for us. And so, if you're discouraged today because you're going through something difficult, if you're discouraged today because you're facing chastening and you're facing trials and you're going through some kind of suffering as we often do in life, Here's God's message to us this morning, verse 12. Wherefore, if you know all these things, if you know that this is your loving Father in heaven guiding you and directing you and making you to be a partaker of His holiness and your suffering that you're going through, it says, lift up your hands that hang down, your discouraged hands that are wanting to give up and your tired knees Lift them up. Be encouraged. This is God working for your good. Make straight paths for your feet. Deal with the problem. What is the problem? You know, when Jesus came, He says He's going to make the mountains low and the valleys He's going to exalt them. That means He's going to, he's going to deal with the problems. He's going to take them out of the way. And that's what we need to do. Make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. You know, if we have a problem, if there's things that make us struggle, if there's things that cause us to stumble, deal with them. Make straight paths for your feet. Don't go to places where you know you're going to get tempted and that you're going to fall. So be encouraged. Do the right thing. Make straight paths for your feet. Follow peace with all men. And holiness, which out no man should see the Lord. Pursue peace, pursue holiness, and walk carefully. So what tends to happen when we go through trials, when we go through testing, when we go through hard times, what tends to happen is we get discouraged. We lift the hands down. We let our hands fall down. We get weak. Sometimes when we get discouraged, we just give up trying. Say, we go to the things that we know hurt us and harm us. We don't make straight paths for our feet. We don't avoid the places that we know bring us down. Instead, when we're discouraged, we go to those places that we know are going to harm and hurt us. Our addictions. Often when we get discouraged... 
we get grumpy. We don't follow peace with all men. We get irritated. We get annoyed. We get upset easily. Because I'm going through a hard time. Leave me alone. And we forget to live a holy life, a whole life. And so when we endure, when we are faced with chasing, when we are faced with correction, there is a right way and a wrong way to respond. Discouragement is a wrong way to respond. Going to the thing that where we can numb our minds and our hearts is a wrong way to respond. Being grumpy is a wrong way to respond. Verse 15, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble we, you, and therefore many be defiled. Here's another response that we sometimes get when we're tested and tried and become bitter. Why is this happening to me? Why did this have to happen? Why me? Why now? Why not... A different time to someone else in a different place. We get bitter. Why do we get bitter? Why do we get discouraged? Why do we go to the things that we know are going to hurt us but numb our pain? Why do we not pursue peace? Why do we not pursue holiness? Because we're failing of the grace of God. We get bitter. And we do these things. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of bread or meal sold his birthright. Here's another thing that happens sometimes when we're discouraged, or when we're chastened and we get discouraged. We become profane. And the word profane, what it means is we don't put real value on something that is valuable. Esau was a profane person. He valued his bowl of pottage more than he valued his birthright. Esau was a profane person. He did not value his birthright. He gave it away for a meal. The birthright, the responsibility to lead his family, his tribe, to fulfill the promise and covenant of Abraham. Get away for a bowl of soup. He was a profane person. That's profane. You trade something of incredible value for something cheap, worthless. A fornicator is also a profane person. He devalues something God has valued, marriage and love and all these things. And he discards it and throws it away for something cheap and an imitation. A fornicator is a profane person. Just like Esau is a profane person. And when we live our lives without grace... We allow profanity into our lives. And what that means is we might not be as profane as Esau or a fornicator. But profanity is just not valuing things that are meant to be valued. And we can trade things of great value, our walk with God, our relationship with each other, our things that are of great value, and we can trade them away for something of much lesser value. Because right now... I'm feeling down and discouraged. You know what? I don't really care. And the things that come with that attitude. And so we need to walk carefully and avoid profanity in our lives and value what is truly valuable, value what God has valued. The consequence of Esau, 
getting rid of his birthright. Verse 17, for you know that afterward when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected and he found no place of repentance. He couldn't change anything, even though he sought it carefully with tears. Esau tried to reverse his profanity. He tried to undo what he'd done. It was impossible. He couldn't go back. He couldn't reverse his actions. He couldn't reverse the consequences of his actions. And the consequences were painful. And that's the way it often is. It's hard work. Often, it takes diligence to have grace, to pursue grace, to have God's grace in our lives. We need to stay connected with Him. But if we don't, we will have consequences that we never intended for ourselves. Like Esau here. And some of them are irreversible. So, in our grace, our quest for it, how do we know that we can find it? How can we know? We know we need it. We know if we don't have it, we will lose courage. We will end up in the wrong places. We will not follow peace. We will not pursue holiness. We will get ourselves into all kinds of mixes and troubles that we can avoid. How can we know that we can have this grace? Verse 18, we are not come. He's talking about the old covenant here. We're not come to a mount that might be touched, Mount Sinai, and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, but the, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. And the children of Israel heard the voice of God on Mount Sinai. They said, Moses, this is too much for us. We can't handle God. He's too much for us. Can you go up into the mountain, Moses, and you talk to God, and you just tell us what he told you, Moses. That's all right. We're, 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 he's, this is too much. Just, we'll just listen to you, Moses. For they could not endure that which was commanded. This was a holy mountain. If so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Moses shook when he came and he saw the presence of God. And so the writer of Hebrews is saying here, we're not come to Mount Sinai. That's not where we are at. It says, but you are come unto Mount Zion. Unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that blood which speaketh better things than that of Abel. This is where we're come from. This is where we'll come to. He says, you're not at Mount Sinai. You're not at the place where you need to be afraid to come into the presence of God. No, you have a place. Jesus has rent the veil. Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Jesus who brings his own blood that speaks better things than that of Abel. Abel's blood says, I want vengeance. Jesus' blood cries, forgive them. That's where we come to. That's the place where we find grace. And He welcomes us. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, Yet without sin, let us therefore come boldly, come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy 
and find grace to help in time of need. God calls us, welcomes us to come into His presence to partake of His grace. The grace that will help us overcome. The grace for trials. The grace we need for chastening. The grace we need for holy living. He says, come, come, I want to give it to you. See that you refuse not him that speaks. This is talking about Jesus. For they, for if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, Moses, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaks from heaven. We have a greater opportunity than anyone under the old covenant. The consequences of refusing are still the same or even greater though. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised. So in Sinai, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised saying, once more, I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, so just talking about what he just said, I will shake heaven and earth. This line here, yet once more, it tells you, signifying the removing of those things which are shaken. So it's going to come a time where Jesus is going to shake heaven and earth, and the only things that are going to remain are the things that cannot be shaken. And that is his kingdom, verse 28. Wherefore we receiving a kingdom that cannot be moved. Let us have grace. I love that phrase. Let us have grace. Let's have grace. And the word have there, we could say, let us obtain grace. Let us go get grace. Let us have it. And then we'll be able to serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Let us have grace. And so here we have in this chapter a cloud of witnesses. People who have run before us. People who have availed the grace of God and have lived their lives victoriously. That have run the race with patience and have endured and have won the crown. We have them as examples. We have Jesus what was their secret? What did they have that we can have? And that word is we can have grace. We can have grace. But the thing with grace is this. The verse I read in verse chapter 4, verse 16. Let us come to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace. God doesn't just simply take grace and dump it on us just because we happen to want it or need it. He wants us to come look for it. He wants us to come find it. He wants us to search for it. He wants us to pursue it. Find grace. Find grace. Come into His presence and find grace. It is there for us. It is there and we can have it. And He invites us to come into His presence and find it. And that is going to be the key to our living this life and being victorious like this cloud of witnesses and like Jesus who um, by grace tasted death for every man. A couple of other verses here in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 10, verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness 
boldness to enter into the holiest, enter into the presence of God. How? By the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which He consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say His flesh, through His flesh, we can enter into that holy place, and we know we have a high priest there. Having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful that promised And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much to do more as you see the day approaching. I want to look at this one little phrase here that says, In Hebrews chapter 12, it says, Looking diligently, verse 15, Lest any man fail of the grace of God. That speaks, yes, we need to do that for ourselves, but we also need to do that for each other. We need to lift up each other to that throne of grace. When we see someone fail or fall, what is our reaction? Is our reaction grace or condemnation? Which covenant do we give to them? the old of the law condemning them, or do we lead them and guide them to the place of grace where they can find, where they can find, like it says in Hebrews chapter 10, their hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. This is our responsibility to ourselves, to, to each other, to provoke unto love and to good works, to assemble together and exhort one another and so much more as we see the day approaching. No, we know that we can't really, we can't in any way, shape or form, live the life that God has called us to in our own strength. There is no way. There is no possible way that I can live out the Christian life. I can't. I can't do it. I will fail. And so the message I have this morning is very simple. It is this line here, and we'd be good. Let's remember it. Let us have grace. Let us have grace. Let us have grace for ourselves. And, and, and that doesn't mean that I can be easy on myself and just overlook my failures and my sins That doesn't mean that I can overlook parts of my life that I'd rather not look at. But let us have grace for ourselves rather than condemning ourselves to repeated failure. We can have victory, but it's going to come through grace. We can overcome but it's going to come through grace. We can walk with God as He's called us to, but it's going to come through grace. And that grace has to be sought. We have to let us have grace for ourselves. Let us have grace. Let us have grace for others. We need the grace of God, but so do our brothers and sisters. We all need the grace of God. So rather than when, when, if this comes 
Like I said, rather than condemning or criticizing, let's have, let's have grace for each other. And let's point each other. What, what else can we really do? What else can we really do to give courage to a brother or sister? What else can we really do but point him to the throne of grace? What, what can I really give to anyone that's of any substantial help to someone who's falling or failing but the throne of grace? Let's point each other to the throne of grace where we can find strength to overcome, where we can learn true values, walk away from profanity, and live holy lives. Holy lives that are whole, that are complete, that are lives that are lived the way God intended for us. We have to avail ourselves of this grace for ourselves and for others. Jesus told a parable of a servant who owed the king thousands and thousands of talents. And he said to the king, have mercy and I will pay you everything. And I'm sure the king must have known this man could have never, never paid this debt. It was too large. It was millions of dollars. And he was just a laborer. He wasn't making that much money. There is no way he could have ever paid that debt. And he forgave him. But then he went out and found someone that owed him a few dollars, maybe five dollars. Grabbed him by the throat and said, pay me what you owe. Give me my money. The king heard it and said, Where is that servant? Where is that wicked servant? And he called him into his presence and said, Listen, I forgave you. I forgave you a massive debt. You owed me millions. Here for five dollars, you will not forgive your brother. What is your problem? What is wrong with you? Let us have grace. We are all in need of forgiveness. We cannot walk unless we walk in grace of God. And so let's strive, each of us individually, to have grace, to obtain that grace, to live your lives by that grace. The thing about this grace, you know, it seems like we can't, you know, find it, and now we've got it, and now we, it's in our backpack, and we're okay. We can't do that. It's like you get grace, and you got it for, you know, one day, and you have to go find it again. That's the walk that we need to have. But that's what God is calling us to. Find grace for yourself so you can walk through trials. So you can take courage in your trials. So you can do what's right in your trials. So you can follow peace in your trials. So you can pursue holiness in your trials. So you can still walk carefully in the midst of your trials and temptations. Find grace. And it's there. It's there and it's given to us freely by God who invites us and welcomes us and says, it's here. Come, I made a way. I, I, I understand. I've been here. I'm your high priest. I know. Please come. But we have to come. He doesn't just, yeah, I think you need some. And yeah, we'll give it to you. No, he comes to, he gives it to those who come. But it's there. So come, come. And then finally, let's have grace with one another. We know our 
own weaknesses. We know our failings. We know our shortcomings. We know our struggles. We know the grace of God that it takes to live life for ourselves. We know the struggle. Let's be gracious. Let's have grace for each other and, and lift each other up to the throne of grace and encourage one another to have grace, each for ourselves, so we can follow God. In uh, final verse, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Let us serve God acceptably, and we can do that when we have grace. So God bless you, and let's seek to live this way.